This is CUNY TV, the television station of the greatest urban university in the world. As the sun sets at the end of a New York workday, the mind transitions from daily tasks to the cloudier, more philosophical regions of social issues, culture, and politics. In a democracy, every perspective on the world is important, and people in art and culture have surprising bodies of knowledge that can shed fresh light on today's reality. The following conversations with Ellen Birkenblit, Andre Asiman, and Lori Simmons took place at that time of the day. Ellen Birkenblit is a painter who lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. Her semi-abstract paintings conjure a private world of fanciful and evolving characters, most often birds, witches, and tigers. She studied painting at the Cooper Union, and her work is in many important museum collections, notably MoCA, Los Angeles, and MoMA, New York. Your painting is sort of a physical act, right? And I, I think it's almost maybe like if you work not specifically for a deadline of a show or something, you're basically staying in shape. Maybe so much the muscles as the, the skill, the precision. My work feels very athletic always to me, especially most of the paintings are so large. I feel like I do have to stay in shape physically to um, move them around as I do because I rotate them as I'm working on them. And and imagine you're climbing on and I climb on th things, yeah, yeah. ladders. And <laughs> I feel like my uh, interests are so narrow in terms of how to spend my day. My biggest need is to go to the studio every mm -hmm. day. So I've never had that thing of making work for a show. When I read descriptions of your work, they describe it a lot for a long time. And then they sort of don't seem to know where else to go with it in a way, because it is so strikingly formal, I think, and it does seem to be its own little world with its own cast of characters. It feels very kind of insular. There is a moment where you do have to shut the door of your studio, whether it's um, wherever that is, and um, really let that part of your mind one part shut down, the other open up. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really that simple. But I think that's not a constant, nor should it be, a mm -hmm. constant state of psyche. I think... Um, you can't live in that permanently. You have to... It would be disgusting. <laughs> I think it would just be so Self -indulgent horrible. Self-indulgent. Yeah. yeah. And it's crucial to making things, but the other part is as crucial. When yeah. you're aware and awake and walking down the street and reading the paper. It's crucial for having like human relationships. You know, yeah. you couldn't, we couldn't just live in our own work all the time. Maybe some people do. But I also feel like there's a, like a studio without walls concept too, where mm -hmm. when, when I personally am walking down the street, I'm, I'm also making up stories in my mind and, and also um, seeing different colors mm -hmm. side by side for a tenth of a second. And I feel like that all goes into the... Yeah whatever that's called, you know. Do the, you think um, you think visually or something? I mean, do you, do you actually understand the world through flashes of color and shapes? I think I see the world in terms of little vignettes and mm -hmm. things. So color is part of that vignette and, you know, it's sound, it's everything, smell, um, and it's physicality. We're actually afraid maybe to be left with our own minds in a certain way and I think maybe advertisers and corporations don't want us to be left with no, our own imaginations no, because not. they want us to need products to yeah no right the imagination <laughs> is like right is the right antithesis of product right. need talk about the ultimate sustainability right maybe. right you have it all like right here you don't need anything right your paintings involves a pretty minor cast of characters repeat performances by certain people who change over time. A tiger, a bird, and a female persona. I don't think I could reveal too much because I think they keep changing for me as well. Right. I also think of the lines that I make and very calligraphic. They're really like drawing letters. Starting, which is often a profile, but quite often, especially again with the paintings where there can be more layers, mm -hmm. What might start as a tiger might end up as a witch, and what might start as, um, you know, a witch might end up as a car. Actually, I'm doing some trucks and cars right now. Uh -huh. <laughs> um. I want to say that, you know, for you, you're sort of um, creating for yourself a theater where you stage a drama, but they often don't feel completely resolved. Like, they feel, That's they feel, true. and I, maybe it's like a French movie that, 
doesn't really kind of come to a happy conclusion or any particular conclusion, but somehow that's more satisfying than. Oh, I'm glad. Than it than it would be than it would be if it all worked out or it didn't work out either one. Yeah. I feel like they are pretty um, open-ended, and I think it also has to do with the way I work, where there's um, many going on at once. Mm -hmm. um, any one of those paintings is up for grabs in terms of me going back to it, mm -hmm. even though maybe I'll think it's finished for a few months. And I like the idea, and I think of this word a lot, uh, is nonchalant. Mm -hmm. um, Getting chalant with work <laughs> to me feels like where and everything shuts down. I never so. thought of that before. Chalant means hot, right? Oh, it that's be, true. Yeah, yeah. So not hot, you know, it's kind of cool. Oh yeah, it's cool. It's the French word for cool, not chalant. You know yeah. what? Thank you, Kevin. I didn't really I never put that whole. Of that. Yeah. yeah, that's good. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, <laughs> it's a French way of saying cool. Which is even cooler. <laughs> yeah. Your father was a chemist, but he was actually a really like passionate amateur photographer and I know he took a lot of pictures of you and actually our family he started taking pictures when he was about 12 or so he he grew up in the Bronx he was an only child he got mm -hmm. a camera um, they didn't have money at all but he found it a camera and then he built a little darkroom in their bathroom so when we were all growing up as kids my father uh, put a darkroom in our house. Which could have been a second bathroom for you all, but... Uh. Absolutely. It was a half bathroom that really was needed. was needed. And I feel like that is so... I'm so like my father in that my way of painting is so diaristic. It's really right. how one processes their life through feeling materials and making a, a solid thing. Wow. A photograph. Yeah a painting, mm -hmm. it's like writing a diary. Mm -hmm. And he would get so mad at me because I would say, you know, I became a painter because of you. Mm -hmm. And and that really would make him mad or it would make him laugh. Because it confuses him? Not at all, but I think he just thought I was saying something to make him feel but, better about the fact that I chose uh, a profession that's not a profession <laughs> <laughs> at all. Well, one question um, I wanted to ask you too was, um, do, do you feel that painting is less or more relevant now in the world? And I, I think sometimes paintings like poetry, it feels so oh archaic. God. And yet, I feel the whole society really wants to escape into fantasy more and more. If that's what my paintings do for people, I'm thrilled. I'm so thrilled. If, if it gives them a moment to pause, mm -hmm. then that's what I would love mm -hmm. my work to do for people. I, I have no agenda with my work other than to make people pause for a second. Ellen Birkenblitz's last solo exhibition closed in October 2018 at Anton Kern Gallery in New York. A show of her most recent paintings opens January 29th at Suzanne Filmetter Gallery in Los Angeles. Her work is also featured in a two-woman show with sculptor Sarah Brayman titled True Blue Mirror, which opens February 9th at the McAvoy Foundation for the Arts in San Francisco. Andre Asiman is an Egyptian-born writer and distinguished professor at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. He is the author of several novels, notably Out of Egypt, a memoir of his childhood in Alexandria, and Call Me By Your Name, the film adaptation of which has received numerous award nominations, including four Oscars. Your family got to New York, though, you guys. How did you manage that? And difficultly. It was yeah. very difficult because my father had lost all his money, all his fortune, his business. Everything was taken away from him when he was kicked out of Egypt. So we arrived in Italy, and we were basically living off the dole of family members who had settled way before us and mm -hmm. who had money. Eventually, I went to school in Italy and then come to the States to go to college. I wanted to go to an American college. And so my parents said, well, okay, fine. It's a good idea that you go to the States. We'll come with you. There's a line in Out of Egypt, though, of somebody saying, I'm thinking about where to go uh -huh. and like Japan or and that not New York there are too many Jews in New yeah, York. Yeah, oh yeah, that was a thing. That was a thing. <laughs> the, New York is filled with Jews. How could you live with so many Jews? Right, right. That was my father who said that. <laughs> you know, he, uh, but we came here and it turned out to be very hospitable. Mm -hmm. I mean, immigration does work. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's funny, we have the Javits Center behind us. Senator Javits was behind my coming to the States. <laughs> I arrived too late to be admitted into the fall semester. 
So I had like four months to do nothing. And I found a job at Lincoln Center as a mail boy. And it was my immediate induction into the USA or at least New York. And it was wonderful because I had a job, I had money for the first time since ever. Right. I also like the fact that for the first time in my life, I didn't have to hide that I was Jewish. I think it's probably why a lot of gay men come to New York too. It's a... Uh, it's open. Yeah. It's an open world. Right, right. And it's an amazing place. I mean, yeah. you don't even have to tell people you're gay because <laughs> it's, they don't care. Is the story of the adaptation of Call Me By Your Name, is that is that interesting? I mean, the fact that it's an older man, younger boy or... There was never any question about that, the yeah. older, younger thing. Right. Some That's of the right. people who have discussed it, and I hate discussing it, they call him a child. Right. You know, he's not a child. Right. Maybe right. legally he is in the States, right but he's not in Europe, and, and get over it, okay? It is he who makes the passes, he who establishes. The other guy is saying, no, I don't want to, I, it would be wrong. Most people assume that an author is so possessive of his work that... He doesn't any, want to see it changed. He doesn't want to see it changed, does not want to see it altered or yeah. even touched up. When I discovered that James Ivory was going to do the script and that Luca was going to film, and mm -hmm. I knew both their work, and I know nothing about movies, but I knew both of them, I said, this is ideal. I have to shut up and let them do what they want to do. I was on the set for a few times, and you're in it. I'm in it, yes. I, they, they, they coax me into that. Do you want to be in the film? Eh, I don't know. It's Come one of on. the gay uncles or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the person who's my partner is, in fact, the producer of the movie. Mm -hmm. So we have this um, amazing sort of moment. And what I love about it, too, is it's not just a um, the shame of, you know, homosexuality. It's, no. it's also happening with the boy and his girlfriend. I was thinking that this is, you know, pre-gadget, pre-texting communication where everything happened just in what you could do face to face with somebody. I remember how terrifying it was at the age of 16 or 18 to actually reveal feelings to somebody. God, yeah. But you know why it's terrifying? It's not terrifying because of the kind of sexuality. I think fundamentally desire is shameful. Whatever ethic you belong to, mm -hmm. to want somebody, to want to hold them, to want to touch them and mm -hmm. do something with them yes. is embarrassing if you don't know what they want. And eventually, if you see them every day, you break down. Let's talk about sort of the pansexuality that happens in a lot of your books. It strikes me that that's long been a condition of human existence, but it feels to me like in the modern period, we've sort of striated into these categories or something. I of think so. Certain behavior. And I feel now, strangely enough, that gender orientation, these things are sort of breaking down. Like there's a prescience in some of what you've been writing about that feels very relevant to to right now. I don't think about it as I'm writing. Right. I go where my my gut tells me to mm -hmm. go. Sometimes it's below my gut, but I, I mean, I, I go there. I realize that when you write, you cannot have shame. I can have shame with people, but I cannot have shame when I write. If I'm going to write, I'm going to have to say what it is that I feel. Mm -hmm. And I find that younger people, people who are not even 20 today, are totally comfortable with sort of this kind of malleable and mm. floating free sexuality. One day they're this, the other hour they're that. Yeah. They are both at the same time. <laughs> Isn't this what humanity has always been mm. like? I've noticed in a lot of writing recently that there are these sort of non-linear models yeah. where you jump around and maybe Enigma Variations is one of those. Is that a trend in writing or is I it? I think it is a trend. I did it for totally different reasons mm -hmm. uh, because I had these chapters of, of my life, of my imaginary life, uh -huh. that weren't reconciled. And I wasn't going to reconcile them into a large novel where you, the character was one day this and one day he does that. I didn't want these connectives that would create sort of fraudulent transitions. I do think that the traditional, traditional realist novel is dead mm -hmm. and should be dead mm -hmm. because it's awful. But I think that most people write in that tradition. They do a kind of kaleidoscope so, effect, yeah. They might be imitating cinematic narrative in they some might ways, right? Be. Yes, it's kind of that, or it's more like the cartoon situation where you move from one image to another image that has not connected. You're supposed to create the, the, the transitions yourself in your head, and then you realize, oh my God, this is where it's going. I get mm -hmm. it, okay? I have no patience for these kind of experimental novels. Now you cover similar themes in so many of your books across different books and in different forms. And I feel like in some ways, you don't try to do everything in one volume. In some ways, I think maybe if you look up at the shelf, the books you've written, that that in some ways com 
becomes a total work of art. Is that something you consciously steer toward now? As no. You're, no. As I'm about you just to die? Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> no it's, it's more like there are young people who write with the sense that they're, they're accomplishing an oeuvre mm. that's going to have a particular <laughs> voice. And I'm saying to them, that therefore you're writing basically one book many, many times. Mm -hmm. I'm against that. I think that everything I've written is different because I've written about, you know, exile and sexuality mm. and God, how are you going to reconcile those? But it's usually about a certain problem that I have, and I'll tell you what it is, not that you asked, but it's a problem with the, the trouble with living in the here and now. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to be in the moment. Or as Montaigne used to say, when I dance, I dance. When I do this, I sleep, I sleep. When I eat, I eat. I don't know how to do that. That's not me. So macho. Yeah, well, it is a bit <laughs> macho. Call Me By Your Name won Best Adapted Screenplay at the 90th Academy Awards. Andre Asaman has confirmed that he is writing a sequel, which will also be directed by Luca Guadagnino, and likely to welcome back stars Timothy Chalamet and Army Hammer. Asaman's other books are gaining more attention, and it won't be a surprise to see more adaptations. Laurie Simmons is an artist and filmmaker associated with the Pictures Generation, a group that includes Cindy Sherman and Louise Lawler. Since the 1970s, Simmons has photographed scenes with dolls and life models as feminist commentary. Her feature film, My Art, which she wrote and starred in, was released in 2016. I made exactly the movie that I wanted to make. Every frame, every sentence that I wrote, every costume, there was nobody except for people that I really trusted telling me what to do. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the blessing of not having anyone in the film business support you or finance you that you get to do to make the movie you want to make. And it's so kind of the question about being an artist making a movie versus just doing something that's part of a Hollywood machine, right? Right. right. And it's also the question of do you want this movie to be your Hollywood calling card so that you make more movies and you get opportunities to direct the next Marvel comic hero. That's not what I'm doing. It feels to me like, you know, everyone's got a novel in them or something and you did your novel in the movie. It gets it's kind so of, true. It's kind of personal, but it's not totally. Yeah. It took me so long to write and so long to get the funds to make it. The people who liked it want to know if I'm going to make another movie and I keep saying, not if it takes that long. <laughs> I mean, it's just like there's no time. But you'll be, you'll be faster the second time. I'll be, I have to be faster the second time. You learn to act, right? Or you'd had before a little bit already. The acting thing is the hardest thing for me to talk about because for some reason being me like hi it's Lori or, mm. or, or speaking in front of a group I have way much more self-consciousness but tell me I'm somebody else and I'm fine I love the way actors don't need any tools sometimes when I'm doing it it doesn't feel that different than when I'm taking pictures because I'm totally in the zone but I love that actors have their brains and their bodies and their voices right. and you don't have your axe you know you're not playing the guitar you don't have your paintbrush your art is obviously, your still photography is obviously a lot about Hollywood and media and things like that. So you have sort of a picture in your mind of how something's supposed to look. I do imagine what I look like from the point of view of the camera mm -hmm. because I can think that way. Right. It's like Maya Lin said when she was asked about how she thought of the Vietnam Memorial, she said, I thought of something that would make people cry. Like it was just sort of, she just imagined what that would be that mm -hmm. would be effective. I had thoughts much more like that. I knew how I wanted the movie to feel. Interestingly, I'm a visual artist, but I knew more about that part than I did about how it was going to look. I think having ideas as you get older, it becomes harder. Feeling inspired by life becomes harder, especially if you've settled in some way, if you've had a longtime partner, if you live someplace, if you've done things. What I see in your career is very interesting. You've, you've had kind of a renaissance of your series, The Eyes Closed, How, how We see. see. It's based on things, tricks that we've seen surreals do yeah. and things. But it was not so, my idea. But it was completely <laughs> original and completely like monumental as a statement. That's so nice to hear but I it makes me think about how as an artist you have to keep raising the bar and I'm you know I live with a painter my husband Carol Dunham who's constantly challenging himself you know he always says that he lets the paintings tell him what to do mm -hmm. and we've always both shared the idea that boredom or complacency is evil there has to be some sort of benefit for toiling all of those years and not getting the kind of commercial compensation you you see some of your right. friends get 
The art market favors young youngsters, honestly. Everyone's yeah. looking for like hot young yeah. things, and they have a peak, and then it kind of goes away, maybe. But well, one of the things that my husband also said is, if you can make it through mid-career, you can be working for a long time. And I remember I had my first show when I was 29 at Artist Space, and I remember thinking it was like a game show. There are two doors. <laughs> one door is money, and one door is critical response. Mm -hmm. And I was written about in the Village Voice. It was a, by Ben Lifson the first mm -hmm. time I saw my name in print, right. and. I regret to this day that I chose the critical door, but I did because I thought, <laughs> I want to stay current in some way, meaning I want, I want to stay in people's awareness. I want them to know what I'm doing. And I, mm -hmm. what I was really saying is, I want to be around for a really long time and mm -hmm. make my art. It's a longer term plan, I think. It's you a know, long term plan. But it only works if you're good at it. Getting back to how we see, what is it about still images that are still so compelling? There's something about looking at those pictures that's fascinating. It's not just the technical trick. You know, I'm really committed to not telling a story in yeah. my pictures. What I love about stills, it's like being able to capture so much in one image and knowing, like intuiting what size to make it and how to frame it. I mean, I think about it a lot as an object. Yeah. And I think about the object as having a kind of separate life from the experience I have shooting it. It's mm. empowered in some way. Totemic. Yeah, kind of old fashioned in a way. You mm. know, it's totemic is a really great word. But when you're learning to be an artist, or when I was young, and I started out making tiny, tiny pictures, and gradually the pictures became bigger, but it's that understanding like, Especially now, there's a trillion photographs. Mm -hmm. Like, what what can I do to make something that mm -hmm. stands on its own in a certain way, in an odd way? Or you've got to think about being different from something that exists in a magazine or on Instagram or Facebook. You want to have new experiences. You want to feel like you know you're doing things you don't know how to do. I think that's a great right. benefit of being older and not being so settled with everything. You know. I really hate saying these words, but I'm going <laughs> to say them anyway. It keeps you young, and I feel like that's true. Um, in terms of having children, like the things that I learn or the ways, and, yeah. and young people working in the studio. I vowed when I was a younger artist that I would age into being an older artist and be really open to what younger artists were doing because I kind of categorized older artists that I met into two groups. Mm -hmm. This is going to sound narcissistic. The ones that were interested in me and the ones that weren't. Right. The ones that were kind of um, afraid of me and mm -hmm. the ones that were really curious. So much of it is distorted now, like visual evidence, documentary photography is so distorted by um, the context, the circulation of, of images. Of we're overloaded by it. So much of it is fake and false. And it's just a great way to just decide that anything... Dismiss it. Yeah, just dismiss anything you want to dismiss. Mm -hmm. My father was a dentist in one little office connected to our house, and I used to sit there and read Life and Look magazine. So I was little, and the magazine was like this big, you know? <laughs> Beautiful photo essays, magazines that invited that sort of... Uh, Storytelling yeah. through pictures. Through yeah. the pictures, and that was a way for me, a little girl on Long Island in Great Neck, to understand what was going on in the South, what was going on with civil rights, what was going on in Russia, what Khrushchev looked like, you know, mm -hmm. all of these really amazing things. That's gone. How do you be the age that you are or that I am? And, you know, you don't have to stay current in ridiculous ways. Mm -hmm. But there are ways to really feel like you can plug what you do into a contemporary world. I don't know what yeah. else to say. You can figure out how to grow with what's around you. Don't fight it. Right. Yeah, I yeah, mean, the I... thing's worth fighting. We agree about it. A retrospective of Laurie Simmons' work, titled Big Camera, Little Camera, is on view at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth until January 27th. The exhibition then travels to the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, where it opens on February 23rd. An illustrated catalog accompanying the exhibition was published last year by Prestel Publishing. <laughs>